song here. You want to hear the story of how I made it through when life is full of trouble, pain, and fear. The answer may sound simple, though everything else crumbles. One thing has remained through all the years. I still serve an amazing God. parted waters he still makes a way today he has always brought me through life's troubled sea he's the one who fed the thousands whose words can calm the tempest he's my bread of life and he's my peace still serve an amazing God. He's been with me every mile, my weary feet have trod. He still cares, and He still hears. He still mending broken hearts and drying tears. Old world is bound to change. Oh, but I'm glad I know the one who always stays the same, and my song shall ever be amazing. God, you're still amazing. And he still hears, he still mending broken hearts and drying tears. Oh, this old world is bound to change. begin reading in Ephesians uh, chapter number 2 uh, beginning in verse number 19. 
The Bible says here, now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation and the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the, all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. And let's also, now let's turn uh, to 1 Peter uh, chapter number 2. This is where we're going to spend most of our time here tonight. Uh, but in 1 Peter chapter number 2, and we'll begin reading in verse number 4. If you found yourself there, uh, say amen. Amen. Well, the Bible says here also, uh, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Sion, chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which he be disobedient, I'm sorry, which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, or whereunto also they were appointed. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Uh, Father in heaven, I'm so thankful once again uh, to be saved. Thank you for allowing me to be uh, your child. Uh, Lord, I don't take that lightly. Thank you for allowing me to be an ambassador, a representative of the kingdom, Lord. I have no authority under my name. Uh, I do not come from a family of great riches, of great clout, but I'm glad I've been adopted into the family of God. Thank you, Lord, for giving me authority uh, by the power of the scriptures, uh, by the power of your spirit. And tonight, I'm asking you, Lord, to help us. Uh, as we dive in, Lord, help us, uh, even though we've heard scriptures uh, read before, even though we've been in some of these passages, even though we've heard some thoughts, uh, Lord, do not let the devil and his demons, do not allow our flesh uh, to tune you out. Uh, do not allow ourselves, Lord, uh, just to go through the motions, uh, just to go through the routine, Lord. I pray that we would get a fresh touch once again, Lord. I pray that you would open up our eyes uh, to what you have in store for us. Uh, Lord, I thank you for saving us. Thank you for uh, getting us started, but salvation was not the finish. Uh, salvation was just the beginning, uh, the beginning of a personal relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that tonight, Lord, we would take another step in the right direction. Lord, help us to grow uh, as we ought to grow, Lord. Help us to become uh, who we ought to become, Lord. Help us to continue to move forward to our destiny as a believer. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for all you've done, all you've continued to do, Lord. Please continue to be with our pastor, Lord, and his family. Uh, be with those that are away. I pray that you'll bless them as well tonight. Uh, have your way and will. Uh, let it be done, Lord, and I pray that you'll save sinners there, uh, save sinners here. I pray that you'll encourage saints here, encourage saints there, and let your son be lifted up in this place. Uh, we love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray and ask. Amen and amen. Well, here in, um, and when we find ourselves in Ephesians chapter number two, uh, we see that Ephesians is written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul, as we've stated before, as you've heard many a times, uh, was a great man. He was an apostle. He was uh, a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the one that was on the road to Damascus. And although he had his plans and he had his agenda and he was going to persecute Christians, God had another plan. And God met him there on that road. And he was forever changed on that day. I'm glad the day that I met Jesus Christ, uh, the day where he stopped me dead in my tracks, I'm glad that I can truthfully say I have never been the same. And it is not because I've been good, not because I've been faithful, but it is only because the Lord Jesus Christ made a difference in my life. Uh, you cannot meet Jesus and walk away the same. Uh, you cannot have the Holy Spirit enter into your life and you be the same. Oh, you might not be perfect. Oh, you might not get it right the first time. Oh, but if you've been saved by the grace of God, guess what? You have been changed. And Paul was changed. 
and thank God for it. But at this time, uh, there was a lot of persecution going on. At this time, um, um, being a Christian was just not something that was shunned. It was not just something uh, that was talked about by friends. Uh, this is something that they were getting locked up for. They were getting beaten for. They were getting martyred for uh, because they knew of the power of Jesus Christ. They saw the difference uh, that Jesus Christ and his believers were making, and they tried everything in their power to put a stop to it. But Paul, he found himself at this time when he penned um, the book of Ephesians, he found himself in prison once again. Uh, I believe he found himself in prison in Rome, and when he penned Ephesians, he also penned Colossians. And if you look at those two books of the Bible, they find themselves very similar in a lot of respects, uh, but yet uh, there are certain parts that are a bit different. Uh, Colossians was very direct. Uh, it was there. He wasn't cutting no corners. Uh, he wasn't tiptoeing through no tulips or lallygagging through no lilies. Uh, he was shooting it straight. And uh, he was going uh, for the juggler. And when he, when he gave that letter out, he, he had it for a particular people. And he had it uh, obviously given by Almighty God. But he gave it. And he gave it to the people just like it was given to him by God. But when he penned Ephesians, uh, he also, he gave it to us in the same manner. But this time, uh, he was not getting, uh, he was not, uh, I guess, uh, writing this letter uh, to cause, uh, uh, I guess, a, a stirring up. He wasn't uh, giving it, I guess, as harsh as the book of Colossians would seem. But he wanted us to be able to take this and notice in the book of Ephesians, uh, he wasn't just writing um, to particular people. You see that he didn't name a specific people because it was meant to go to the church of Ephesus, but also after that, it was supposed to go to the other churches in the, F uh, in the area, um, including the church of Laodicea and the others that were there. Uh, it, was, it was supposed to be used for all of them. But he wrote this and the Lord allowed him to pen this for them to be able to see this and to be able to meditate, to take it and to chew on it, uh, for them to be able to be stirred in their minds, uh, for them to be able to know uh, the truth, but also uh, for them to be able to, to learn some things and to grow as a church. And as I'm looking at uh, this book of Ephesians, as we look at this uh, brief passage, uh, I want us to be able to take this time and to be able to see uh, what he has in store. Uh, here we find ourselves in verse number 19, and I'll read it and we'll go through it together. Uh, I, like, I like Wednesday nights. Uh, it's not always the most populated. Uh, you have your faithful church members, amen, on Wednesdays. Uh, but I, it's a time where we're able to have a Bible study. Uh, I don't claim to know it all. I sure don't. Uh, but I'm glad we can take time and not just, uh, you know, just get energized and, and be able to, to come out here, you know, just running out the door. But I'm glad that we can take some time and really see what God has to say in the word. But we see here it says, now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And it says here, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And that's really uh, what I want us to look at tonight. Um, the, the title, if you were to put a title on this, um, the title that I have is Your Response Determines Your Results. Right. I'll say that one more time. Your response determines your results. And I'm talking about your response to the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm glad that both in the book of Ephesians and, and in the, the passage in 1 Peter that we're going to look at, it makes mention as Jesus, not just as, as Jesus Christ, or not just as Jesus the Messiah, or the many other names of God. Uh, I'll take a side note to say I had a great time in my Sunday school class uh, this past Sunday as Brother Sam uh, just, just taught, <laughs> just taught uh, the truth and was able to go over the names of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey church, those things are important. Uh, they will make a difference in your life to see the characteristics of the Lord, uh, to see who he is, not just what he does, but who he is, what makes him him uh, it, it, it helped me but tonight we look at Jesus Christ the cornerstone yes, Jesus Christ the cornerstone and then in another scripture in uh, first Peter it says that to some he is Jesus Christ the cornerstone but also it makes mention as him as Jesus Christ the head of the corner yes. now they're one and the same talking about the Lord Jesus Christ but they're talking about two different responses that people or that people can have to the Lord Jesus Christ and the results that differ for both. And we're going to take a look at that. And uh, for those that know me know that I like sports. I like, I enjoy basketball. And um, there's no greater basketball player in my mind uh, than the bald-headed Michael 
Jordan. I almost said Jackson, Lord of mercy. But Michael Jordan, number 23, Chicago Bulls. And I'm glad you can look at uh, Mike, you know, I want to be like Mike. Uh, you know, I, I enjoy those commercials. Sometimes they find their way on, uh, on some kind of uh, video uh, thing that I'm able to see at. But Michael Jordan, uh, boy, he, he, was, he, w he was the greatest. Uh, boy, he, he could get that ball and he could make things happen. Uh, he was someone uh, that had worked very hard uh, to become who he was. Uh, he, he grew in his skill set. Uh, he was a person that uh, you could trust at the end of games to be able to close things out. And uh, he, he was a person that was very talented on the basketball court. But Michael Jordan, just being that one person, uh, there's two different responses that I saw uh, towards Michael Jordan. Uh, to certain players, uh, maybe like the Utah Jazz of the day, uh, with Stockton and Malone, uh, guess what? They did not like this Michael Jordan. Uh, to, the, to the bad boys, the D Detroit Pistons, another team in the league, for those that uh, don't know what I'm talking about, just bear with me for a second. But these teams, they, they did not look at Michael Jordan as the greatest of all time. They did not look at Michael Jordan in admiration. Or they did not look at him as, as, someone, as, a, as, as someone that they enjoy. They looked at Michael Jordan as a problem. Michael Jordan to them was a problem. He was the same person, very, very skilled, uh, had, had a, lot, uh, a lot that he could do. Uh, he would close out games, but guess what? For them, because they were on the opposite team, a lot of times they would find themselves playing against them in the finals for the championship, trying to win uh, the, the championship, the trophy, trying to get those rings. Guess what? They found themselves time and time again coming up short. Why? Because of Michael Jordan. So to Michael Jordan, for them, he was a problem. But yet, for his teammates, for those uh, like Scottie Pippen or even uh, the Dennis Rodman, I hate to say it, but even those on the bench that we don't even know their names, guess what? To them, he wasn't a problem. <laughs> to him, he was someone that uh, was a blessing to them. It was somebody that they were glad uh, to have him on their team. Why? Uh, because he helped them win. Uh, because he helped them win championships, six of them, matter of fact. Uh, he allowed them to get rings. He allowed them uh, to become somebody when if they, those same people were on a different team, they would look at him a little different. Michael Jordan, one person. A great person, a great athlete, a great uh, basketball player, the greatest of all time, but yet to one people, he was a problem. But yet to the other, he was a great player, a great teammate, and someone who brought them great joy. Now let's bring it home. The Lord Jesus Christ, he does not change. He is faithful yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, he came born in a manger. He could have been born royalty. He could have been born uh, in the king's, uh, in, in a castle. He could have been born on a throne. He could have ruled and reigned on this earth as they thought he would. He could have had great physical armies and destroyed. But no, he came and he humbled himself as a servant. He came and he walked this earth. And he grew in wisdom. Uh, he, he was one that uh, served he was obedient to his earthly parents, and he, he was a, a, a good child, as he ought to be. Uh, he was one that I'm sure was tempted many a times, even as a child, but as an adult, we see in the Scripture, he was tempted. But yet he sinned not. Uh, he was a, a, the Lord Jesus Christ. He came down as 100% man and 100% God. He came and he died on a cross for our sins. Uh, he bare our beatings. He took on those thorn of, of that, that crown of thorns. He took on those, there, those nails that pierced uh, his hands and his feet. Uh, he took uh, the beatings that uh, it, it made him uh, even look like a, a person that, that they couldn't even fashion, uh, that he was a person. They couldn't, it, he didn't even look human. Uh, but yet he died and was buried in a borrowed tomb, and yet he rose again on the third day. Hey, Jesus Christ, this one, to some of us, he is our joy. And we'll look at other things, but he is our cornerstone. He is the one who we build our lives upon. As a church, uh, as a good church, 
all of, good churches all around this country and around this world, good churches have their foundation on the cornerstone. Uh, he is where that building starts. Uh, he is where when the building, when a brick gets puts on the wrong way or when there's something that's not done right, you can always go back to the foundation and realize uh, what was planned when, from the beginning. I'm glad that, hey, to some of us, he brings great joy, but also to others. Uh, especially to people that haven't trusted in him as Lord and Savior, uh, to those that are lost, uh, to those that are disobedient, uh, to those also that are saved, but yet they're not allowing God to take full control of their life. He is not God, the chief cornerstone, the great God, the God of all joy and strength, but yet we will find in the scripture that he is the God that causes us to stumble. He is a God that causes us uh, to fall and causes us to be of offense the Bible says. Why? What would cause us to stumble? Why would Jesus cause us to stumble? Because he's righteous. Because he's holy. Because he does not change as we do many a times. Or because, guess what? He has given us away. This is why to some of us, and, and maybe some of us on different days, it might change. Some days it might bring us, Jesus Christ might bring us great joy because we're on his side and he is propelling us forward. But other days we aren't who we're supposed to be and we find ourselves going against the grain. And we find ourselves stumbling and falling short on this life. And so tonight I want to look at what is your response that will determine your result. Nobody's come today. Nobody's looked at life and said, I don't want to be successful. I don't want to fulfill God's will for my life. I don't want to do anything. I just want to chill. I just want to just do me. I just want to just go through the motions. None of us, I don't believe any, any one of us that got any sense, okay, would honestly say we don't want to do anything. We don't want to make a difference. But yet, we'll find ourselves because of our response to the cornerstone, our response to the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll find ourselves coming up with a lot of different results. And so let's look at it for a second. We'll continue to go through this. And I'm going to go through Ephesians quickly, and we'll get to 1 Peter. We're going to go through exactly what God has for us, and then we're going to be out the door. But the Bible says here, as, as I continue to say, and I'll, I'll read from verse 20. It says, and built upon the foundation. Okay, so here, when we look at it and, it, and it goes on talking about the temple, but it's talking about people. It's talking about believers. It's talking about God's church, okay? I'm glad that church is not just made up, as I've said many a time before, just one group of people, okay? It's not just made up of one race. It's not just made up of one culture. God has brought together those who he deemed to put in this local body for his purposes. Okay, I'm glad that it, is, it was not my choosing, although I love you all, and I love your pastor, and I've, I've enjoyed my time of getting to know you all through the years of me visiting. But it was not my choice at the end of the day to be at Haynes Baptist Church. Not saying I wouldn't have chose you, I'm not gonna be me. But in all honesty, it was not my choice. But I knew the Lord had us here for a purpose. The Lord brought us here. For you, many of us come from different churches. We come from different areas. But God brought us together for a reason. And we see here that it's Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. As this local body, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who we are built upon. I'm glad for programs. I'm glad for, for good ideas. I'm glad for a lot of different things that would help us to better be effective. But nothing takes precedent. Nothing ought to become more important than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That is who we are built upon. We are built upon who he is, who he has for us to be. We are built upon his word. We will not change on those bases. Why? Because if you look at our roots, if you look at our foundation, that is what we are built upon, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. I'm glad that he put that fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple, unto in, um, in the Lord. You see here that God, he puts you and puts me, he puts teachers 
and preachers. He puts uh, people that, that have different talents and abilities. He puts people that have been through different experiences and different backgrounds. He fitly brings us together for his purpose. But notice, church, notice, groweth, groweth. Thank God for what he's doing for us as a church. But we have not arrived and we ought not to quit. It is not time for us to just say we've done enough. Uh, just because we've seen God do things here that he might not have done down the street for many, many, many years. Uh, just because we've been blessed beyond belief. Hey, guess what? God is not finished. We ought to continue to grow. Why? Because we are in the Lord. I'm glad that we're, this is not just an organization, but this is an organism. This is a living, breathing body. And as we are fitly brought together from the Lord Jesus Christ, let, let us not look at each other and get jealous because you're good at something and I'm good at something else. Let us not uh, get envious of each other because God has given you that and God has not given it to me. Or let us not look at each other and say, hey, uh, you're different and, and, and I, don't, I don't like that type of food. Or, uh, you're different. I don't know about this or that. Those little preferential things. Let us realize that, hey, Everybody brought here from the, young, from the young men that come from open gym, from people that come from down the street, from people that might get out of jail and that might get a gospel track and that might walk through these doors. Or whether it be somebody that comes with great physical riches and, and worldly possession that comes in and wants to be able to use those things for the glory of God. Those that can sing and that have talents, those that come in the choir and that want to worship the Lord. No matter who it is, realize and don't get jealous because God has brought us to get together fitly joined to be able to grow in the Lord, to become the church and the temple that God has established. God has a reason why he has us here. Uh, there, there is no doubt in my mind uh, that God has a purpose, and he has greater vision that we could ever see to our children, our grandchildren, uh, how they will be affected by the decisions that we made, allowing God to bring us together here in this local body. And it says, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Oh, this is something to take for serious. We, our body, our, 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 the, who God made us, guess what? We are a habitation yes, of the Spirit of the living God. Amen. Oh, boy. Now, when, when, you, when, you, when you swallow that, when you think about that, Dirty old us, sinful us, inconsistent us, but yet he saved you and he called you to an holy calling and he's gave you a reason to live, but yet he's given you his spirit. That's why you cannot fail. That's why you cannot quit. That's why you can be victorious. You can get over that sin. You can get over that obstacle. You can get over those difficulties. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is living inside of you. I'm glad that when I was, when I was just getting into this Christian living thing, before I was even saved and I learned about doing right, I'm glad that even in my own strength, I tried uh, to, to maybe get myself together physically. I tried to get myself together in a lot of ways that I saw other people in the church, the way they look, uh, the way they carry themselves. I tried with the music. I tried with, my, with, with uh, getting a proper haircut. I tried wearing different clothing. Uh, I tried uh, doing all these things, but guess what? On my own, I failed every single time. I might have lasted a day further than last time. Maybe I even lasted a month this time, but I never had victory until the Spirit of God got a hold of my life and saved I didn't just say a prayer. Guess what? He saved me. Made a difference. I had, to re I had to repent and turn away from my sins. But guess what? The Holy Spirit indwelled me, and that's how I know that I can have victory. But guess what? I, am, I have to realize every day that I wake up, I didn't just wake up for Pete. It's not just about what I feel like listening to. It's not just about what I feel like doing today, where I feel like going, who I feel like talking to, who I don't feel like talking to. Uh, I have to realize that, guess what? I am the habitation of the Holy Spirit. And I have to be obedient to him. 
And so I'm glad here in Ephesians, it talks about the cornerstone, but it's talking about the local church, really. And it's talking about um, those that are in the local church and talking about how whether you, you, you're, you're Greek or Jew or whatever, God brings everybody together as long as they know the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we get to, to meet the Lord Jesus Christ at, at the cross and we see him where he is and he finds us where we are and he saves us and changes. Guess what? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And God can do something. But I'm glad we see here that this cornerstone, this is why we as a church, uh, where we find our foundation and where we find our, our strength and where, we, where we're able to move together and where we realize who we are in Christ. But tonight I do want to look at and go through this quickly. But I want to look at the difference between Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, and Jesus Christ looked at here in 1 Peter chapter number 2 as the head of the corner. Well, the Bible says here, in chapter 2, verse number 4, to whom coming as unto a living stone. Now it's referring to Jesus Christ as a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Men rejected him. His own rejected him. But guess what? <laughs> he was chosen by God the Father for a purpose. And yet it says he was precious. And we'll look at that word shortly. But it says ye also as living stones. Okay, now it says that Jesus Christ refers to him as a living stone. Guess what? He's not a dead stone, church. He's a living stone. That's why I don't have dead worship. That's why I don't have a dead Christian life. That's why you, don't, you ought not have dead devotions. And you, not have, you ought to not live in your workplace as a dead Christian. Why? Because we are living. We have a living God. But yet, as it refers to Jesus Christ as a living stone, it refers also to us as believers as living stones. Why are we living? Because we have life in Christ. But it says here, ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Here it's talking about us, uh, talks, talks about the priesthood. Okay, back in, back in the Old Testament, as you had priests, you had priests that would go before the people and they would give sacrifices unto God on the, on, the, um, on the behalf of the people of God. Well, here it's talking about us and saying that, hey, now you are, a pre give, gives us the priesthood uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. But it says here, you give your sacrifices. Here it says in um, verse number five, uh, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ ought to work in the believer to give spiritual sacrifices. I want to ask you, church, when's the last time you sacrificed because Jesus worked in you? When's the last time you gave up a little television or you gave up a little money or you gave up a little bit more of your time or you gave up a little food or you gave up a, a, a little uh, extra time of prayer or you gave up a little pride. Spiritual sacrifice. Acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. But then it says, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. Okay, now I'm not too far, I'm not too big uh, with certain words. I like to break it down, okay? Break it down and make it plain. And so I want to give you these definitions, and I hope that it'll help you like it helped me. But it says here, okay, refers to Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. But it says elect. The definition I have for elect is chosen or worthy to be chosen. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. But also, it says here, precious. The word precious is talking about of high price or great value, <laughs> very valuable or costly. Hey, Jesus Christ, the one who saved you, the one who bought you with his own shed blood, he's not just old anybody. You ought to not treat him like you treat your other friends. You ought not to just treat him like you treat uh, the people here on this earth. Uh, you might treat uh, them good, uh, and unfortunately nowadays, a lot of people treat their pets a lot, of, a lot better than they treat people. But I don't care whether it's your pet boo-boo or your friend Suzu or whatever it might be. You ought not treat anybody to a higher price or hold somebody of more valuable than the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Guess what? My mama can't give me victory over sin. No, she can't. My best friend, he cannot give me the peace in difficult time. But the Lord Jesus Christ can. He cannot allow me, my, my friends cannot allow me to see the finish line. Can't get my mind right when my finances go bad. Oh, but Jesus Christ will get my mind centered on him every time. He's precious, a high, of high price, great value, and very valuable or costly. But it says here, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Now the word confounded means you shall not be what? Bewildered, confused, perplexed. Oh, it has helped me, church. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm excited. Why? Because I've been here, and I've found myself confused, and I've found myself perplexed, whether it be about the will of God on my life, or whether it be about decisions that ought to be made, whether it be why storms and trials come in my life, whether it be whatever it might be, i found myself here, but it's not Jesus that has changed. It is my response to Jesus Christ. And I've had to realize that, hey, it's not God that has me confused. He is not the author of confusion, the Bible says. But yet it is myself that has allowed myself to be tricked, has allowed myself to be susceptible to this old wretched flesh that has brought me to that point. Hey, you might find yourself confused, perplexed, and bewildered tonight. But you don't have to stay that way. He's still calling you. He's still here knocking on the door. And he's saying, hey, listen to me. Follow me. Die to yourself. Why? (laughs) Because you don't have to be confounded if you believe on the precious chief cornerstone. It says, unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them be disobedient. And now it's going to go into the other one. But I want to share with you these four things. They're not alliterated. Uh, they're, not, uh, they're, not, they're not put together pretty. Don't try to uh, find the first letter of them and see if it, if it says something. You're going to get eps. That's what you're going to get, okay? But as a believer, going right and having a proper response to the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, guess what? You will realize that he is the elect. He is the chosen one, chosen of God the Father for us to die but yet to live, to have victory, to overcome. He is precious. He is of high value. But also, it is that chief cornerstone, that foundation. That, that is where we get our strength. Sometimes as people, we, we don't find the strength to go on. We don't find the strength to have that victory. But yet, every time you get into the scripture, I guarantee you, even if it has to be on this altar, you will find strength in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he doesn't change. If you found him there, if you establish your foundation in Jesus, guess what? Your your building might start leaning a little bit. You might have, God might have to make you tear down some some of your walls and rebuild them, but guess what? That foundation is short. (laughs) And you can find strength in that. But also you find stability. Notice he said you won't be confounded, but Sometimes we get, and I'm not saying that you're just going to be in one place for the rest of your life. You're just going to live in Winston-Salem. I'm not going to say that God's not going to put you on the mission field or he's not going to change things. He's not going to give you a different job or or change up things. But I'm saying stability in Christ. I'm not worried about, oh, I'm not going to be a Christian today. Mm -mm, Not looking good. Oh, man, it's raining outside. Woo. That that Buddha, he looked like he been eating good. You find the stability in other things. Oh, man. Uh, finding stability and finding comfort in, in, in food or finding comfort in pleasures of this life or finding comfort and pleasure uh, in sports. Hey, guess what? Nothing wrong with sports, but any time it takes the place of the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? It's wrong, church. But you can find stability in that chief cornerstone and you can find foundation. No matter what goes on in your life as a believer and having a proper response to the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what goes on in your life, you can always go back to where he got you, to where he found you. But now it changes. And I only have two things. But we look at the head of the corner. It says, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone 
which the builders disallowed. Now, I had to look up that disallowed. Now, it, the easy way to put it is, guess what? It does not allow, right? But I, I, had, I, I had to figure it, it went at least a little deeper. It says to refuse to allow, to reject, to refuse to admit the truth. Okay? This was them and their response to Jesus. It says here, disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner and a stone now of stumbling and a rock of offense to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now here's a different response. Now it's easy to say as a lost person, and a saved person. Looking at it from that perspective, okay, when I get saved, I have the proper response to the Lord Jesus Christ. Realize that I cannot get to heaven without the Lord Jesus Christ, and I have to submit to his authority. I have to submit to the fact that I cannot get there through my works, but it is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the grace of God that I can have eternal life with him, that I can have victory, I can have a personal relationship with him. That is one response. But also, every day, you have to choose what kind of response you're going to have to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it shows us here that when we're obedient to him, he's the chief cornerstone. He's that foundation. He's that strength. He's, he's precious. But when we're disobedient, whether as a lost man be disobedient or a saved person wanting to live in their flesh or a saved person following away from God or a, or a saved person getting distracted or a saved person uh, losing track of who God has called them to be. We see here that he has become a rock of stumbling. I, I looked up the word stumble. It says uh, an obstacle uh, to progress. Oh, I like that. To stumble. Jesus does not change. But guess what? It's his way or it's the wrong way. You're going to do it by the book or you're not going to do it right. We see churches failing many a times. Why? Because they don't want to do it his way. We see people, they call themselves Christians. People that on your job might quote scripture and cuss. <laughs> Uh, people on your job that might claim the name of Jesus but live a certain lifestyle. And we see that they have no stability, see that they continue to stumble. Why? Because they find themselves running into the head of the corner. Why? Because Jesus does not change. And we find here that Jesus Christ, if we have a certain response to him, he will cause us to, uh, what does it say? It calls us to have to have an obstacle that will keep us from progress. He will cause us to be slowed down in where we want to go. The destination that we have of wanting to be financially uh, fit or wanting to, to, to maybe preach the gospel. Maybe you want to be a pastor, a missionary. Maybe you want to be a teacher. Maybe you want to be a doctor or a lawyer for the cause of Christ and for the glory of God. Well, guess what? If we go to God and we have a, a certain response or a wrong response to the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? He will be that stumbler rock that will cause you to slow down. He will cause you to fall. He will cause you to, to not be able to become who he's called you to become. Why? Because he's not just going to bless anybody. But he's going to cause us to stumble if we have that response of disbelief, if we have that response of disobedience. But the last thing that we see here is that he is the rock of offense, the rock of offense, uh, the act of attacking, the feeling of resentful displeasure caused. Sometimes we give the devil and we give Satan and the demons credit for things that they have nothing to do about. Sometimes we as Christians, because of our own disobedience on our response to the Lord Jesus Christ and his word, guess what? We feel like we're being attacked. Or we feel like, uh, like, like, uh, like things are going on in our lives and we don't understand, but if it's because we're being disobedient to God, guess what? It could be the Lord Jesus Christ in his righteousness and his holiness trying to get a hold of you. Yes, He's trying to get you before you get, find yourself doomed or damned. 
You find yourself uh, finding yourself uh, being eliminated from your fight. You find yourself getting too far out where you can't get back to what he's called you to do. You, sometimes you might feel like he's attacking you, but he's doing it out of love, church. He does not change, but he fi- we can find himself as the head of the corner. And now I want to ask you, church, what is your response to Jesus? Oh, it's easy to say, oh, he has my life. Oh, he saved me. Oh, he's called me. And we quote scriptures in a cliche manner. But to, well, this week, what has been your response to Jesus in his word? Have you been faithful in your witness? Have you been faithful in your calling? Have you been a faithful ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you finding yourself stumbling? Are you finding yourself struggling? Because Jesus Christ, he's the same. But yet to the believer, to the obedient, guess what? He's our strength. He propels us to greatness. He allows us to do great and mighty things which we don't understand. We, we, don't, we don't know how we did it. We don't, I, I don't know when I go to open gym and I open up the script. I don't know how people get whatever comes out of my mouth and they trust in Jesus. <laughs> they give their life to him. I, I don't understand it. I don't understand why, why somebody will walk through these doors uh, because I invited them. I don't understand why, why God is still loving me the way that he does. But guess what? When you're obedient to him, you'll find yourself being propelled by the spirit of God and by the chief cornerstone. But if your response is found disobedient or you find yourself at odds, don't go all around the bush trying to figure out what's going on in your life. Look at your foundation. Check that chief cornerstone and make sure you're built on the right thing. Let your response help you to, sh- I'm sorry, let your result show you what your response is to the Lord. Sometimes we, we, we like to think a little highly of ourselves and we think we're okay. But look at the results. Are you closer today than you were yesterday? This year, are you closer to God? Have you, have you become more and more like Jesus this year than you did last year? If not, it might, it might be that our response might be off. But if we find him, I trust that he will be our chief cornerstone. I've run over time and we're, we're, we're praying and we're going to have a brief invitation. But I want to leave you with these two verses that are right after the verses that we read in 1 Peter chapter number 2, uh, chapter number 2, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says here, <laughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, I was on the wrong page. It says here, of which, I'm sorry, no here, receiving, uh, good night. See, the Bible didn't change. I changed. I changed the page. (laughs) But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You haven't always been saved. You haven't always been a child of God. But thank God that now, If you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, guess what? Now you find yourself with the mercies of God, with the chief cornerstone. Uh, If you would, let's bow our heads and close our eyes as we go to the Lord in prayer. I'm not going to prolong the service, but I do take full confidence in knowing that I shared exactly what God had put on my heart. But I want to ask you, church, you might be here and you say... (laughs) I do love the Lord, and I I have trusted him as my Savior. But if I be honest with myself, I found myself looking at Jesus as the head of the corner and not the chief cornerstone. 
but I'm not content being there and I ask you to pray and help me. If that's you tonight and you say, hey, I'm finding myself in this position, but I'm not content here and I'm asking you to pray that God would help me. If that's you here tonight, I want to ask that you. As the pastor, I want to thank you for viewing our video today. However, if God's dealt with your heart, we do not want to end this video without giving you a chance to be able to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. If you're there today and God's actually dealing with your heart, I want to remind you what the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us has had problems, issues, sin, failures, faults in our past. But the great thing is this, is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming through the Father but by me. There is a way to be able to have hope, to have eternal security within the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to know that you're saved by the grace of God. Now the great thing about the Bible is it tells us about the love of God. He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's amazing to a lot of people, and they can quote it. But the beauty of it is this, is the very next verse tells us the purpose of Christ. Because the Bible says, For God sent not a Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through Him might be saved. That means that God sent His Son to die for those of us who are sinners so that we can have fellowship with God Himself. Now, if you're there today and God's really been dealing with your heart, I want to ask you this question. Do you really believe that God's been dealing with you about salvation? If that's the case today, then I want to tell you what you need to do is repent of your sins. You need to die to yourself. Admit that you're lost and you're on your way to hell. And then look at what the Bible tells us, that He tells us that we can be saved through Christ. Who do you call on? There's only one. As the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ and Christ alone. So I tell you today, would you trust in Christ? When I ask you, would you, would you trust in Him as a personal Savior? You say, Brother Jason, I don't really know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you, the Bible also tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It don't matter who you are, where you come from, God sent His Son to die for everyone. If you've made this decision today to be able to trust in Christ, to be able to die to yourself, to, to be able to start living for Christ and accept Him as a personal Savior after repenting, would you do us a favor and be able to contact us at 336-788-0551 and let us know about this decision that you made so we can start praying for you. Thank you so much.